Pharrell Williams announces July 4th is canceled. Corporations pulled their money from social media at the behest of the leftist censors. And COVID-19 cases continue to rise, but hospitals aren't overwhelmed. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. This show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Stop putting your online data at risk. Get protected at expressvpn.com slash Ben. So remember when this whole thing was about trying to put together solutions for instances of police brutality? Remember it was about better policing? And now it has nothing to do with better policing. Now it is just about virtue signaling, largely by white woke leftists, who oddly enough have decided that they are the most important people on planet Earth. Now, that is a natural outgrowth of the sort of philosophy promulgated by Robin DeAngelo in her crappy book, White Fragility. I have a brand new YouTube video you should go check out about White Fragility. It's 30 minutes of hate about White Fragility because the book is just terrible. But the entire thesis of the book is the only important people on planet Earth are white woke liberals. They're the only people who are important because they are the ones who control the systems and are complicit in the systems. And so if they do not fight back against the systems of power and the hierarchies of power, well, then they are letting down black Americans. And black Americans are robbed of all agency in Robin D'Angelo's world. And this means that white woke liberals might even have to be a little paternalistic toward black people. Well, you can see all of this on display in a video that was going around Twitter yesterday. There's a a man of color who is going to a, a fence in his neighborhood that is covered top to bottom with sort of Black Lives Matter propaganda, and he's taking down the signs because he lives across the seat, the street, and he says, I'm sick of looking at this fence covered with signs, right? I want to look at the park. And a, a young white man then proceeds to try and tackle him, comes charging down the street and starts screaming at him and explaining to him he is not woke enough. So that this, I think, fairly encapsulates how America is working these days. This is the same thing as the white yoga pants wearing Lululemon moms, young moms, who are screaming at black cops in New York City and Washington, D.C. Uh, this idea that the white woke left, they have come for all of us. And that if they do not listen, if they do not listen, if they take a perspective on America that is different than the perspective taken by Black Lives Matter, this means that they are unwoke. And as I say, this thing has extended far beyond, far beyond the idea of police brutality or even disproportionate police use of force, which again, there's no evidence that police disproportionately use deadly force on black and Hispanic Americans. According to Roland Fryer, there is some evidence that police may use disproportionate force in low level force situations. So for example, patting people down or grabbing somebody during a police encounter, but it's very difficult to control for that because you don't know exactly how people are interacting with the police or what prompted that, but that's what Roland Fryer's study says. But the idea that black people are overwhelmingly being shot by the police or that the police are overwhelmingly systemically racist or that they are stopping people for driving solely because of the color of their skin as opposed to how they are driving, the evidence for that is incredibly scanty. But the narrative has moved from from that to the more broad application of the quote-unquote anti-racist narrative. And as I discussed yesterday, the very term racist has now been redefined. So Ibram Kendi, who is most famously associated with this neo-Marxist notion of anti-racism, that has been redefined. So anti-racism is the basic idea that if you oppo- if you do not oppose the promulgated systems of the United States, if you do not oppose the Declaration, the Constitution of the United States, capitalism, then you are then you are complicit in racism. You are part of the problem, right? There's just racist and anti-racist. There is no such thing as not racist, because racist used to mean that you believe that one race is inherently superior to another, and if you don't believe that, you're not a racist. But now racism has been redefined to mean any system that results in inequality between outcomes for groups must be a a systemically discriminating system. And therefore, if you stand for any of those systems, you yourself are discriminatory and you are complicit in white privilege and you are complicit in whiteness, right? That is the theory of Ibram Kendi. It it makes no sense, obviously, because the fact is that Asians and white people don't have the same level of income. Does that mean that the systems were built for Asians? That the inequality of outcome means inequity? designed by a privileged hierarchy in the United States. Of course, that's not what it means. But the Ibram Kenzie idea is if you don't oppose the systems, then the systems themselves are the root of the inequality. They're the root of all inequality and the systems must be torn down. And this means that anything that has to do with the systems has to be torn down. And this is how you end up with somebody like Pharrell Williams suggesting that July 4th is bad. So Pharrell Williams is, of course, an incredibly famous and successful singer, songwriter, and music executive. This is not somebody who has led a radically difficult life in the United States. By all indicators, he's led a pretty great life in the United States. This person is probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars at a minimum. This is a person who was born in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and he has a couple of, of brothers. His mom was a teacher. His dad was a handyman. He went to seventh grade summer band camp 
And then he ended up at Northwestern University for a couple of years. This does not sound like the story of wild unsuccess that supposedly America is, is fostering. It does not sound like the story of discrimination and evil that America is fostering. But according to Pharrell Williams, Pharrell Williams says that July 4th is really, really bad. And this is a very bizarre view of July 4th, because as we will see, the great black liberators in American history, particularly people like Frederick, Frederick Douglass, understood that July 4th originally did not apply to slaves. Right? He gave a very, very famous oration, a very hard-nosed and edgy oration, did Frederick Douglass before slavery was abolished, in which he talked about the fact that July 4th was not applied to black Americans. The black Americans looked at July 4th and they said, it's not our holiday, we're still in slavery. It liberated you, but it didn't liberate us. But he said, the point is that July 4th is the ideal to which you guys need to be held. July 4th is the standard that you will be held to. Martin Luther King Jr. said the same thing. But the new brand of black leadership is to suggest that July 4th is inherently evil, that the end of slavery, the end of Jim Crow, none of that means anything. And so July 4th itself needs to be canceled because basically America needs to be canceled. It is not that America was built on high ideals that people failed to live up to. It's that America's ideals were the founding creed of racism, sexism, bigotry, and homophobia. The systems themselves created racism, right? This is a case that Deborah Kennedy actually makes explicitly, right? That the systems themselves created racism. Racism was, was not even the progenitor of the systems. The systems created racism. And then those systems are still in place today and therefore nothing has changed. And therefore the systems need to be ripped down. And so you can have people like Pharrell Williams who are incredibly successful within the system who are fighting the system because the system itself is the racism. The system doesn't have to be shown to be racist. The system doesn't, you don't have to look at the system and say, here's a racist thing about the system. Instead, all you have to do, even if you're Pharrell Williams and you're a very, very wealthy black man in America who's led an incredibly successful and blessed life in the United States, you can still look at the group inequality data and say, this system is unfair and bad, and therefore July 4th has to go. We're going to get to Pharrell Williams and where this idea comes from in just one second. First, let's be real about this. You shouldn't assume that your monthly cell phone bill is a forever thing. Okay? You're spending way too much money on your monthly cell phone bill. It should be less than it is now, and particularly right now when people are looking to save money because who the hell knows where the economy is, you should be looking at Pure Talk USA. With Pure Talk USA, you can cut costs and free up cash on a monthly basis, starting with your wireless provider. Pure Talk covers 99% of Americans. The president and CEO of Pure Talk is a U.S. veteran who cares deeply about serving Americans by making wireless affordable. Start your saving today. There's no reason why you should be spending a fortune on your cell phone bill. I mean, the, Pure Talk is making it super easy for you to save money. Here's how it works. Dial pound 250 and say keyword Ben Shapiro and you get unlimited talk, unlimited text, two gigs of data for 20 bucks a month. Not 100 bucks a month, not 200 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month. Again, dial pound 250, say keyword Ben Shapiro, you get unlimited talk, unlimited text, two gigs of data, plus you get 50% off your first month, so it's 10 bucks your first month. Stop paying too much to big wireless providers. By the way, the coverage is stellar. Switch to Pure Talk today, say 50% off your first month, dial pound 250, say keyword Ben Shapiro, Pure Talk USA, simply smarter wireless. Go check them out right now and save yourself a bundle on your cell phone bill. Dial pound 250, say keyword Ben Shapiro to get started. Okay, so Pharrell Williams does this interview on CNBC. And he criticizes Independence Day. And then he advocates for reparations. He also suggests that we take off Juneteenth as a paid holiday, which, by the way, I don't have really a problem with. Like, Juneteenth seems like that should be a day of American celebration. That is the day on which the Emancipation Proclamation was finally read to the freed slaves of Texas, which was the last state to read the Emancipation Proclamation. It happened June 19th, 1865. So that, that, is, a, that is a day well worth celebrating. And, and by the way, the reason it's worth celebrating is because it marked a, an actual shift in American history, a shift that so many of the folks of the woke left refused to acknowledge because slavery, according to the woke left, merely went underground, right? Slavery never really ended. It just became, according to Anna DuVernay, a system of, of prison industrial complexes. It simply became, according to Robin DeAngelo, the soft bigotry of the regular corporate world and all of this sort of nonsense. The reason we should celebrate Juneteenth is because it was, in fact, a sea change and it was a living up to ideals. So here is Pharrell Williams ignoring all of that and suggesting instead that Independence Day is, is really bad and therefore. And, and therefore, it shouldn't really be a national, it's not really a national holiday for everyone. When July 4th, 1776 took place, the only ones that were free from the British monarchy were, were our, our white brothers. When you think about June 19th, you know, that marks a two-year period where we were supposed to be free, but we hadn't been still. We feel like the day that we were freed, everyone was free. So why not make that a paid holiday? We deserve that, you know? There's a word that scares so many people. 
You know, it's called reparations. And we deserve that, too. OK, I, I don't understand how Pharrell Williams is worth $200 million, deserves reparations from a white Appalachian guy who's worth $20,000 or zero or zero. That doesn't make any sense to me. Now, to be fair to Pharrell Williams, he's suggesting, again, Juneteenth in addition to July 4th. OK, and, and that, that, again, I don't actually have a problem with. But the criticism of July 4th ceased to apply when Juneteenth happened. OK, the criticism of July 4th became irrelevant by the terms of the deal. What I mean by that is that July 4th was an aspirational holiday about American freedom. And Frederick Douglass criticized July 4th in really strong language, right? Because he said that you're not living up to your own founding creed. But July 4th is a day of celebration for everyone. The suggestion by Pharrell Williams that it's not a celebration for everyone today is obviously very silly. It is a day of celebration for everyone because it does represent the key point in the liberation of all Americans. It just took far longer because of cruelty and evil for black Americans to gain the freedoms that should have been promised to them on July 4th. Here's what Frederick Douglass, who has a lot more, it seems to me that Frederick Douglass had a lot more to say about the problems of racism and bigotry and cruelty of racism than anybody who's alive today. I mean, Frederick Douglass actually lived as a slave, right? Here's, here's Frederick Douglass talking about this. He gave a very famous oration on this, and it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of, of both writing and oratory, very famous. It's, it's one of the reasons why I've, I've suggested that Frederick Douglass is a second founding father who should be put on the American currency, because he, along with Abraham Lincoln, really understood that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States were ideals to aspire to, and America was not living up to those ideals, and they had to be brought into balance, right? They had to be brought into rectification. Because according to a lot of people, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were in opposition to one another. In fact, John C. Calhoun, who was one of the leaders of the sort of pre-Confederacy Confederacy, right? He died before the actual Civil War, but he was, a, he was an ardent pro-slavery advocate. He suggested that the Declaration of Independence was bad, that the only thing that mattered was the Constitution, whereas Abraham Lincoln suggested that the Declaration of Independence is what he called the apple of gold and the Constitution the frame of silver. What he meant by that is the ideals of the Declaration of Independence were protected by the Constitution. So if you read the Constitution without the Declaration, then you would miss the high ideals, which are the reasons that the Constitution was brought about in the first place. And again, slaveholders said, OK, well, the Declaration doesn't matter. That was just kind of something we said at the time. It was something that we just put out. There's a piece of propaganda. The only thing that matters is the hard terms of the Constitution. The reason the Declaration of Independence matters, and that's what we're celebrating on July 4th, right? That's not Constitution Day. That's July 4th. The reason we celebrate the Declaration of Independence is because the philosophy of the United States is embedded in the Declaration of Independence. Really three separate propositions. First, the reality of natural rights, pre-existing government, inalienable and precious and endemic to all human beings. Right, natural rights that exist for you, no matter where you are, right? Not equally realized for everybody at all times, but those natural rights pre-exist government. Second, the equality of all human beings before the law and in their rights. All men are created equal, right? The, that doesn't mean all men are created with equal capacity or equal ability. It means that all men are to be treated the same by the law because you are equal in your rights, those rights that pre-exist government. And finally, the belief that government exists to protect natural rights and to enforce that equality before the law. That's the role of government. That's what the Declaration of Independence is about. American philosophy believes that these propositions are self-evident, right? And then the founders attempted to effectuate that philosophy in the Constitution of the United States. And that's what Frederick Douglass recognized in a way that so many of today's modern race thinkers refuse to recognize. Frederick Douglass said, look, the obstacle here is racism. The obstacle is old-fashioned Brutal bigotry. The, old, the obstacle here is slavery and Jim Crow and institutions of discrimination. You remove those, and what you are left with is, again, that gold apple in the silver frame. But according to so many thinkers today, that's not really the problem. There was no gold apple. The gold apple was always worm-ridden, and the silver frame was always made of dross. Right? That's the actual argument here, is whether the Declaration and the Constitution are inherently good or whether the Declaration and Constitution are inherently corrupt and evil. Frederick Douglass said they're inherently good. We're not living up to them. Here's what Frederick Douglass, a freed slave, who, let me tell you, has suffered a hell of a lot more than Pharrell Williams ever has in his life. And that is not a close comparison. By the way, fair to say, Frederick Douglass suffered a hell of a lot more than virtually every person living in America. The man lived as a slave. Here's what he says. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men, too, great enough to give fame to a great age. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. With them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. What he's saying is that the principles they established would allow for the extirpation of slavery and oppression. And the question he asked, this was his big question in his July 4th peroration. He said, are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? Right, the entire, the entire thing is, I'm not ripping on the Declaration. I'm not ripping on the Constitution. I'm not even ripping on the founders. 
What I am saying is what Frederick Douglass says is those when when these words were written, they were not true for us. But we need to make them true for us because they are great principles of political freedom and of natural justice. What exactly are those great principles? So Calvin Coolidge, probably the most underrated president in American history. Calvin Coolidge was a very good president. He gave the 150th anniversary speech in 1926 about the about the Declaration of Independence. And here is how he described the philosophy of the Declaration of Independence. He said, if all men are created equal, that is final. If they are endowed with inalienable rights, that is final. If governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, that is final. No advance, no progress can be made beyond these propositions. If anyone wishes to deny their truth or their soundness, the only direction in which he can proceed historically is not forward, but backward, toward the time when there was no equality, no rights of the individual, no rule of the people. We live in an age of science and of abounding accumulation of material things. These did not create our declaration. Our declaration created them. That's what we're celebrating on July 4th. And that's something that all Americans should be celebrating this weekend as we approach July 4th. But unfortunately, there is a case afoot to not celebrate those things. Because in the view, again, of so many of the disintegrationists, as I describe in my upcoming book, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps. In the book, I describe people who want to disintegrate the union as disintegrationists. It's not right versus left. It's disintegrationists versus unionists. People who would like to see the country held together on the basis of fundamental principles and people who would like to see the country fall apart. Right? The, the, the basic idea that those principles are themselves rooted in sexism and bigotry and racism and have promulgated sexism, bigotry, racism, inequality, that's a battle for the heart and soul of the country. That is a battle for the, for the entire mind and future of the country. And it's a battle whether we are going to go forward or whether we're going to go backward, because Coolidge was exactly right. Progress, progress what, what made America unique, what makes America powerful, what makes America good, are the original founding principles that we have so often failed to live up to, but that we have always striven to move toward as a country. Not everybody in the country, but the country as a whole. And that we've always, we've, we've tried to move toward that. Stumbling, falling, but overall moving toward that progress. And if you move away from those fundamental principles, and that's what we're talking about right now, destruction of those fundamental principles, right, that all men are created equal, and endowed with inalienable rights, and that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. As we move away from that, we move toward regression, not progression. We move toward either mob rule or autocracy, right? That is what we move toward, not freedom, not liberty, not, not prosperity. All those things become a, a figment of the imagination. And this is, and by the way, the disintegrations are fighting all of these principles right now. The notion that all men are created equal is something that is denied. It is fundamentally denied by the white fragility anti-racism outlook of Ibram Kendi and, and, of, and of Robin D'Angelo. Because again, you can judge someone and their complicity in the system simply on the basis of their race. Okay, that denies. It doesn't, it doesn't actually acknowledge that all men are created equal in their rights. What they do is they play a little word game. They say, what, what we mean by all men are created equal is that if all men are truly created equal, and this is, what, this is basically what, what Ibram Kendi says, if all men are truly created equal, they should all have equal outcomes. That's not what all men are created equal means. All men are created equal means they were created with rights, that they were created equal before the law. It doesn't mean that Colton and I both have the same jump shot. It doesn't mean that I'm going to play in the NBA or be a WWE wrestler or that somebody else is capable of hosting a successful podcast. We all have different abilities. That's called being a human being. What it does mean is that in the eyes of God and in the eyes of the law, we are all equal. The notion that we're endowed with inalienable rights, the left doesn't believe in inalienable rights. The left believes, like the French Revolution believed, that rights can be put aside in favor of the, of the common good, right? That the idea is the common good can overreach those rights. And so this is why you are seeing right now an attack particularly on freedom of speech, which we'll get to in just one second. The, the idea that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, that too is, is overridden. Instead, the left would love to see mob rule because what we're seeing right now has nothing to do with the consent of the governed. Is Chaz about the consent of the governed? And the left is rooting for it. Is, it, is pure majoritarianism the consent of the governed? Because who consents to be governed by a pure 51% majority? Nobody, right? Your, your inalienable rights cannot be alienated by, the, by a simple majority vote. The founders understood this, but all of these things are being disintegrated in the name of a new utopia. And that's really terrible. July 4th has to stand because July 4th is really, really important. Instead, we seem to be moving away from the principles of July 4th by grouping people together in races, by moving away from the principles of Juneteenth, by the way, by moving away from the principles of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, and yes, the principles of the Declaration and the Constitution. And that's a disaster for the country. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, let's talk about the fact that these days, with everybody having stuff delivered to their home, one of the big problems that we've been seeing in our neighborhood is people stopping by your front door and just taking the packages and running. 
people driving up to your mailbox, opening up the mailbox, stealing your Amazon stuff, and then just taking off. Well, you know how you can stop this and you can help stop this? You could have Ring. What happens? Well, Ring is on a mission to make neighborhoods safer. Their home security products are designed to give you peace of mind around the clock. So you can keep track of what's going on on your property any time of the day, anywhere you happen to be on planet Earth at the time. Their home security products, video doorbells, security cameras, smart security lighting, alarm systems. Ring has everything you need to make sure that your family and belongings are safe and secure anytime, anywhere. And with the all new Ring Video Doorbell 3, you can keep an even closer eye on things than ever before. Ring gives you protection at every corner. Video doorbells let you answer the door and check in on your home anytime. Keep an eye on your doorstep or speak to delivery people when you can't come to the door. With outdoor security cameras, you can check in on every part of your house and never miss a moment. Smart lighting brightens up blind spots and makes sure that you can always come home to a brightly lit house. Their full home security systems give you everything you need to protect your family and your pets and your property. Get a special offer on the Ring Welcome Kit when you go to ring.com slash Ben. And that's ring.com slash Ben. The Welcome Kit includes that Ring Video Doorbell 3 and the Chime Pro. It's all you need to start building custom security for your home today. Go to ring.com slash Ben again. That is ring.com slash Ben, ring.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. Okay, so the media are complicit in this attempt to destroy basic American ideals and divide us as much as humanly possible. The New York Times has decided, for example, that they are simply going to change the language. So just like we are now changing the definition of racism so that racism doesn't mean belief in superiority or inferiority of a particular race, Racism is now instead going to mean you're complicit in the systems that produce inequality, right? That is the, that is the basic definition of racism. Now, now we are going to shift the definitions of race in a bizarre way as well. So now, apparently, the New York Times is going to use the uppercase black to describe people and cultures of African origin, both in the United States and elsewhere, according to the United States, uh, according to the New York Times. We believe this style best conveys elements of shared history and identity and reflects our goal to be respectful of all the people and communities we cover. The change will match what many readers are seeing elsewhere. The Associated Press and other major news organizations have recently adopted Black, capital B, which has long been favored by many African-American publications and other outlets. The new style is also consistent with our treatment of many other racial and ethnic terms. We recently decided to capitalize Native and Indigenous, while other ethnic terms like Asian American and Latino have always been capitalized. We'll retain lowercase treatment for white. While there is an obvious question of parallelism, there's been no comparable movement toward widespread adoption of a new style for white. And there's less of a sense that white describes a shared culture and history. Again, this goes back to the, I keep quoting white fragility because that's where this crap is coming from. The basic idea here is that whiteness only exists in opposition to blackness. So there's no such thing as a white identity. There's only a cohesive black identity. Well, you're going to have to explain that one to me, seriously, because you're going to have to explain to me why a person from Haiti and a person from Zimbabwe have the same cultural heritage and history as they have the same, so they deserve to be capitalized as capital B black. They are part of the same cultural and ethnic history. But a guy from Austria and a guy from Germany, nine miles apart, who are both white, they share no common ethnic heritage, none, according to this. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous, obviously. The basic idea instead is that whiteness is bad, blackness is good, because blackness is an identity. White can only exist in opposition to blackness, and therefore, whiteness is truly about racism, right? This is a word that you will see very often in the, in the woke literature is whiteness. Whiteness is a descriptor of badness, right? You have internalized your whiteness. If you integrate into the systems, you are internalizing your whiteness. This is how they can call people like Clarence Thomas an Oreo, right? Because the idea is that he has internalized his whiteness, right? He's a black man, but he's white on the inside because he's internalized his whiteness. By the way, this is sort of the premise of the, of the uh, it's unbelievable this movie really was not perceived as how racist it is. The movie Get Out is really about this, right? The, the idea of Get Out is a black man who's being treated incredibly well by a white family. And then, of course, it turns out to be a horror story about them attempting to capture his body and then turn him into a white person on the inside, right? They literally want to take his body and then take their white souls and put them in his black body to take control of his body, right? This notion that whiteness is the threat because whiteness only exists in opposition to blackness. The only thing that brings white people together is being in opposition to black people is, is quite, it's quite a linguistic twist. But this is the way that we are going to divide the country and make the country worse and worse. That, that is the direction in which we are moving. Okay, in just a second, we're going to get to the funniest story of the day because things are getting wild over at Chaz in Seattle. We're also going to get back into the social media wars because it is pretty obvious right now that the entire woke mentality that says that the hallmarks of your culture of rights need to be disintegrated. If they're not disintegrated, then you are exacerbating inequality. All right, we'll get to that in just one second. Plus, we'll get to your COVID updates. A lot coming up. First, you know, my family... It is growing, and that means that it is time to get a new portrait from paintyourlife.com. So my family, we have a new child. We already have a portrait that's hanging over our mantle. It is just beautiful. It is just beautiful. 
Okay, it is it is a picture of me and my wife. We're on a beach in Hawaii with our with our two children at the time. Now we need to update it. We need our little tiny cute baby. She's the best baby in the entire world. Oh, she's just a cutie. She kept me up half the night last night, but we love her anyway. And we need her in a portrait because paint your life to, paint your life is great. Here's what happens: you get a professional hand painted portrait created from any photo at a truly affordable price. You can choose from a team of world class artists and work with them until every detail is perfect. Their user-friendly platform lets you order a custom-made, hand-painted portrait in less than five minutes. It's quick and easy. You can get a hand-painted portrait in about three weeks. You can send any picture. It can be anything. And they will paint it for you. It makes the perfect birthday, anniversary, or Father's Day gift. It's meaningful, personal, and can be cherished forever. It makes a great gift for your parents, by the way. Like a great gift for your parents. At PaintYourLife.com, there is no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded. Guaranteed. Right now, as a limited time offer, get 20% off your painting. That is correct. 20% off and free shipping. To get the special offer, text the word Ben to 64,000. That's Ben to 64,000. Just text Ben to 64,000. You get 20% off and free shipping. It is an amazing, amazing gift. Paintyourlife.com. Text Ben to 64,000. Celebrate the moments that matter most. It is amazing, amazing stuff. Okay. Meanwhile, this is the best story of the day out of Seattle. And it does demonstrate how the media are willing to go along with violence, so long as that violence suggests that the system is bad and the system is racist. So in Seattle, they've had this idiotic Chaz Chop dangerous place. I mean, they've had several shootings, having four shootings in Chaz Chop since the police were forced out. And Mayor Jenny Durkin called it a street fair. And she said that it was just a wonderful, wonderful place. Well, the chickens finally came home to roost because it turns out that Shama Sawan, who's a nut, okay, Shama Sawan is a socialist city councilwoman in Seattle, I, I know Councilwoman Sawant. I debated her when I was on, when I had a, a specific local show on KTTH, one of our affiliates here on the Ben Shapiro show. And we debated $15 minimum wage. You should watch it. It's, it's quite entertaining. But Shama Sawant led a, led a rally outside of Jenny Durkin's home. And now Jenny Durkin is calling for Shama Sawant to be punished or expelled from the city council for doing that. Right? She wrote a letter to the council president, this is Mayor Jenny Durkin. So Jenny Durkin is perfectly willing to allow fully law-abiding areas of the city to fall victims to anarchy. And she's allowed to, she's, she's going to just allow people to get shot willy-nilly in this part of the city. But somebody marched outside her house. That means it's time to fire the city council, the city councilwoman. She wrote a letter saying, the city's residents and businesses expect us to work on many important issues together, including unprecedented challenges, such as a global pandemic worsening in our city, an economic downturn that could become the worst economic event in our city's history, and a civil rights movement in our streets. The public deserves to see their government working together to resolve differences and face these challenges. Article 4, Section 4, provides the council may punish or expel a member for disorderly or otherwise contemptuous behavior. Some of these violations may be additional violations of the Seattle Ethics and Elections Committee, but all of these fall within the city council's purview. So she's going after Shama Sawant. Why is she going after Shama Sawant? Because she helped people illegally occupy city property, which, by the way, Jenny Durkin praised at the time. Right? She, She encouraged people to do this in the middle of a pandemic and, quote, She used her official position to lead a march to my home, despite the fact it was publicly known I was not there. And she and organizers knew my address was protected under the state confidentiality program because of threats against me due largely to my work as U.S. attorney. All of us have joined hundreds of demonstrations across the city, but council member Sawant and her followers chose to do so with reckless disregard of the safety of my family and children. In addition, during or after council member Sawant's speech at that rally, her followers vandalized my home by spray painting obscenities. Oh, well, it seems, what? The chickens came home to roost for, for, for the mayor, and now she wants Shama Sawan gone. Now she's blaming Shama Sawan for all of this. Why, it's just amazing. It seems like when liberals get mugged by reality, suddenly they're not so fond of their Chaz Chop New Republic beautiful utopias anymore. It's pretty incredible. But the media will go along with this nonsense, right? The media will go along with people who are threatening other people and defacing property and breaking into private property. Block of wood Chris Cuomo over on CNN. He tried this routine last night. So he had on the the mail from the famous couple, the the so-called Ken and Karen couple from Missouri. This was, he's a lawyer in the area. His name is Mark McCloskey. And he was, he he came out of his house with his wife when the situation was, uh, when, when Black Lives Matter protesters broke into a private gated community and walked down the street. And there were some pretty, Stellar pictures of him walking out of, the, out of his house carrying an AR-15, and his wife had a small pistol in her hand, and she's shouting at the protesters. And it turns out that, according to him, the protesters were threatening to burn down his house and do property damage. Okay, so Chris Cuomo has them on his show last night. And Chris Cuomo's first question, his questions are like, why would you do such an evil thing as to defend your house? Why are you defending your house? It's really bad. You need to stop defending your house. Cut it out. And Mark McCloskey was like, 
Um, it's my house. And the reason they didn't burn it is because I was out there with a gun. I understand what you say your rationale was. Uh, to be clear, did anything happen to you or your property? Did anything happen? To, yeah, my, my, my uh, life has been ruined. No, I'm no, 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 target. no, no, no. Uh, we'll get to that, Mr. McCloskey. I don't mean to cut you off. But I'm saying that night, did anything happen to you, your family, or your property? Yeah, it's called social intimidation. It's called terrorism. Chris, what's the definition of terrorism? To use violence and intimidation to frighten the public. That's what was happening that night. It's what happened to me. And that's the damage I suffered. Okay, so the bottom line there is Chris, my favorite part of that is Chris Cuomo suggesting, so nothing happened in your house, did it? Right, because he was standing out there with a gun. Because he was standing out there with a gun. But the bottom line is that once you accept that all behavior, individual, bad individual behavior is the result of the system, then the system is to blame. July 4th is to blame. Right? Once the entire system is to blame for all the bad things, then you can't blame the individual protester shouting at this guy they're going to burn his home. You have to blame the guy who's defending his home because, after all, his home is property and property is bad. And you have to understand that his property is a symptom of an unequal system. And just because the people protesting past his house didn't have houses like that, that means that they are the victims of the system, whereas he himself is actually the perpetrator of this evil, in unequal system. That is the, the nonsense that the left is pushing. Now, if anybody ever came up to Chris Cuomo's house, it would be a different story. Right? If anybody ever calls Chris Cuomo Fredo, for goodness sake, then they are then it's like the, the N-word, apparently, if you, use, if you use Fredo, according to Chris Cuomo. So uh, apparently he's allowed to take great offense at people saying innocuous things like calling him the dumb brother from, from the Godfather. But, he, but if somebody threatens to burn your house, you're supposed to just sit inside and wait on it. Okay, we'll get to more of this in just one second. We'll get to the crusade against social media, which, again, is being ramped up in real time. First... Let us talk about the fact that if you are a small business and you have to send invoices, it can be a giant pain in the butt. So let's say that you are a small business and you got 10 invoices outstanding. So you go over to Microsoft Word, you type up the invoices, you send them out, and then you completely forgot that you send them. You have no update. You have no idea whether the person has seen it. You have no idea you know, how, if you even have to follow up. Also, it's done in Microsoft Word, so it looks super ugly. Instead, why don't you just go use Blink Sale right now? Our friends at Blink Sale, small business owners themselves, built an invoicing software that helps you stay on top of your money and keep tra track of everything in one place. You can stop sending nagging emails to get paid for your work. Instead, you can get back to growing your business. With Blink Sale, you can send beautiful custom branded invoices and estimates in seconds. You can stay on top of your outstanding invoices. It lets your customers and clients easily pay your invoices online. You'll even get instant notifications when a customer opens your invoice, so you'll actually know if they're just avoiding paying. You. Forget about using invoice templates or stressing about coordinating a bunch of different software programs. Blink Sale will take care of all of it so you can spend more time focusing on the work that actually gets you paid and makes your business a success. Go check out Blink Sale right now. It will make your life better and easier. It'll make your clients' lives better and easier because they'll be getting invoices that are actually readable, not just a scan of some Word document you printed off. See for yourself. Try Blink Sale for free at blinksale.com slash Ben. That is B-L-I-N-K. S-A-L-E dot com slash Ben. It's BlinkSale.com slash Ben. And try Blink Sale for free right now. Spend less time billing, more time doing the things that you love. All righty. In just a second, we're going to get again to the attacks on social media, which is the attempt to shut down rights as a symptom of the evil system. We'll get to that momentarily. First, if you're not already a Daily Wire member, you should consider getting a reader's pass to dailywire.com. It's a great value, only three bucks a month. When you sign up, you get that first month for only 99 cents. You also get access to our mobile app, Articles ad-free, access to exclusive editorials like Matt Walsh's new editorial, Activist Wants Imagine to be our new anthem. It is the worst song ever written. Okay, that is not even an op-ed. That is just a fact-based journalistic piece. Imagine is indeed the worst song ever written. If you want to find out why from Matt Walsh's sardonic perspective, go check out our Reader's Pass right now at dailywire.com and sign up for just a dollar. Go check it out, dailywire.com, sign up for just one dollar. Also, as I mentioned before, I, like, I don't pitch my work this way. It is so vital and important and and immediate, that you really do need to pick up a copy of my new book early, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps. It comes out July 21st. It is so topical. It is so on point. All the things that are happening right now, I prophesied back when I wrote this thing in December and January. And I can tell you, it is, it is so relevant and it's not just relevant to diagnose our problems. It is relevant to talk about the solutions, give you the responses that you need when you're discussing these issues with friends around the water cooler. I think it is maybe the most important book I've ever written. I wrote Right Side of History, which I think is a deeply, deeply important book. Go check out the new book, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps at dailywire.com slash Ben. You can pre-order right now. It is out July 21st. So be the first to read it. Check it out, dailywire.com slash Ben. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. So there's a concerted effort right now by the politically, by the politically Machiavellian and by the woke 
to unite in an attempt to use social media to crack down on messages they don't like. That is the, the latest iteration. So wokeness is being used as an excuse to blackmail social media companies into reinstituting a monopoly on informational dissemination. What that means is that it used to be you only got your information from CBS, NBC, ABC, New York Times, Washington Post. That was basically everything. Then the internet comes about, thank God. And the internet, led by people like Matt Drudge, really opens everything up. Right? They really open up the dissemination of information. Now you can go to Daily Wire and you can get a more accurate take on the news from a conservative perspective. Now you can head on over to Drudge and you can check all the headlines from Drudge's perspective. Right? You can go all over the internet and get, well, you can go to Daily Caller and check out their news foundation, which does a great job. You can do all of these things. Right? And that's great. Right? You can check out the Federalist. We have lots of friends on the right and we hope all of them do really well. And you can check all of them. Right? That's what the internet does. It allows for broader dissemination of information. You can watch Fox News now, which is great because now you're no longer relegated to CNN or just MSNBC. And that's a wonderful thing. But the problem is that the media liked being the gatekeeper for information. The media loved being the gatekeeper for information. The problem was they never had a great response to, okay, freedom of speech. Right? The response was freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is great. More information is better. Aren't you the ones who used to proclaim that you would die for everybody else's right to say something you disagreed with? That was literally the slogan of the ACLU, basically. Right? We, we may disagree, but I'll, I'll die for your right to say it. So the left had to come up with a new rationale for why exactly they should reinstitute a monopoly on informational dissemination. The new rationale is the wokeness crusade. And the wokeness crusade is your dissemination of information damages me. Freedom of speech does not fall equally on, the, uh, on everybody. Freedom of speech is actually a reinstitution of the hierarchy. Freedom of speech is inherently threatening. I mentioned Herbert Marcuse a couple days ago. To reiterate the point, he's a Frankfurt School professor from the 1960s, very important thinker. And Herbert Marcuse promulgated an idea called what he called repressive tolerance. And what he suggested was the problem is if you tolerate bad opinions, those opinions might in fact increase intolerance. So instead, what you have to do is you have to stop tolerance for bad opinions and you have to only tolerate good opinions, which normally would call censorship, right? Normally we would just call that tyranny. But he says, no, 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 that's, that's repressive tolerance. In order for tolerance to flourish, in order for the correct perspectives to flourish, what we really have to do is shut down freedom of speech. And this is what you are seeing right now from the woke left. They went after the media, they went after corporations, and corporations are the big leverage point right now. So they're using corporations to go after social media platforms. Now, social media platforms, their original mandate was their platform. You can have debates, you can have open conversations, they can, they can be rough, they can be in their, in their sort of incipient form, but at least you're having a conversation. That is a good thing. More information is better information, right? This was sort of the motto of social media. Then the woke left decided to go to the corporations, which are responsible for a lot of the advertising on these platforms and say, well, do you stand with the worst? Do you stand with the worst people? And now this has always been a dishonest trick. It's really been dishonest. So th this is a trick the left always loves to use with regard to a variety of topics. So I've said before, I believe in freedom of association, right? I do. I think you should be able to associate with whomever you want. I may not agree with how you choose to use that freedom of association, but I believe you should be able to associate with whomever you want. And I believe that if you run a restaurant, you should be able to have whoever you want in and not let whoever you want in. And that means that bad people are going to be able to misuse that freedom. But I think it's important that people have that freedom because I don't think government should have the power to compel you to run your business in any particular way. I think that if you, if you, are, a, a, if you are an advocate of gay marriage and somebody walks in who you don't like, I think you have every right to say to that person, I don't want you in my business. I think, really, I do. I think that, and if I think likewise that you're a Christian baker and somebody walks in and says, I want you to bake me a transgender celebration cake, the baker has every right to say, I don't, you know what, I'm not going to do it. I'm sorry. No, I'm not doing that. Freedom of association matters. I think it's a, an important concept. So what the left will say is, ah, so what that really means is you're standing up for bigotry. No, I'm standing up for the possibility that my perspective may not be the correct perspective. And the left used to appreciate this. You know why? Because the leftist perspective used to be a minority in America. If the, if the right had been successful in limiting freedom of speech, there would be no gay rights movement in the United States. There wouldn't be, right? If the social right had been successful in the 1950s in limiting freedom of speech from a legal perspective or even a socio-cultural socio perspective, those conversations never could have happened. But now that the left is in commanding position, they are seeking to shut down the, the methods of dissemination so that only their messages can be heard. And Democratic senators are excited about this because obviously one of the effects of this will not just be to shut down the the quote unquote, racist messages. And this is, the, uh, um, again, the left uses the term racist to describe everything they don't like. Things can be things you don't like and, and still not be racist. They've used this in order to say, okay, basically we just want democratic messages out there. This is why Mark Zuckerberg is coming under so much fire over at Facebook. Zuckerberg is the only major social media leader 
who has come out and clearly expressed a perspective in favor of American standards of free speech. It's not happened to YouTube. It's not happened to Google. It's not happened to Twitter. Instead, those platforms have basically decided that they are going to cave to the woke left and they are just going to decide that they are that they are perfectly willing to mirror whatever are the political priorities of the woke left these days. And they'll ban anybody or, or target anybody who disagrees. That's that's the way that these social media, these social media companies are moving. In, so instead, boycott groups have decided to go after corporations, which are risk averse and don't like boycotts, and tell them to pull their money from Facebook. And now Democratic senators are getting on board. Right? This is just a blackmail program to, to reestablish a monopoly of information. That's all this really is. It's just a blackmail program from Democratic legislature, from Democratic legislators and social activists going after corporations. That's all this is. It is a simple blackmail program. Get, limit the information that you put out there, or we are going to either regulate you if we're Democratic senators, or we are going to call for boycotts if we are, if we are the activist types. According to Bloomberg, Facebook chief executive officer Mark Zuckerberg faces demands from Senate Democrats for answers about hate groups on the platform. At the same time, a growing number of companies are pulling advertising from its sites over harmful content. I love the, 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 just the, the vague term harmful content. That no one ever defines these terms. What is harmful content exactly? It, does that mean that you saw something that offended you? Or does it mean that somebody's calling for your explicit killing? Like there seems to be a little bit of difference. In a letter to Zuckerberg on Tuesday, three Democratic senators questioned what they call the company's, quote, lack of action to prevent white supremacist groups from using the platform as a recruitment and organizational tool, despite Facebook's stated policies on hate speech. Senators Mark Warner, Robert Menendez of New Jersey, and Maisie Hirono of Hawaii, who's all, all three of those senators, bleh, wrote that the nation is undergoing a long overdue examination of systemic racism, but suggested Facebook is failing to do its part. So now they're using the anti-racist crusade as a leverage point against, against Facebook. All of, by the way, every major executive which is a donor to the Democratic Party. While Facebook has attempted to publicly align itself with this movement, its failure to address the hate spreading on its platform reveals significant gaps between Facebook's professed commitment to racial justice and the company's actions and business interests. The senators want Facebook to detail by July 10th whether and how the company will enforce its policies against hate speech, violence, incitement, and white supremacy, and who at the company is responsible for doing so. So now they are threatening. Nick Clegg, the VP for Global Affairs, he said, we do not profit from hate. We have no incentive to have hate on our platform. We don't like it. Our users don't like it. But it doesn't matter. The, the bottom line is that the Democratic senators are attempting to basically find rare posts that get through the system on Facebook and then use that to club Facebook into submission. Pushing that has always been the execrable technology columnist at the New York Times, Kara Swisher, who has been picking on Facebook for a long time because she would love to see Facebook just shut down all content she doesn't like. This, of course, is, is the same Kara Swisher who suggested to Susan Watch Kiki over at YouTube that she was very angry that her own kid was watching my videos. And could, could YouTube do anything about that? Kara Swisher is just awful. And it is amazing to watch major media companies. Remember, the New York Times was supposed to be a free speech outlet, right? They used to be pro-First Amendment, not anymore. Now they just want to shut down social media outlets that they don't like. And those social media outlets have to be brought to heel. Reddit, by the way, is now banning the Donald sub thread. The re they also banned uh, Chapo Trap House. And they're doing all of this because they just don't like the content, right? So they've just decided they don't like it. So they, 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 they made a new rule change that doesn't even make any sense. They basically said that you can also talk badly about members of a quote unquote majority group, which I suppose means that we can now talk badly about women in the United States since women are a majority group in the United States. So that's exciting stuff. But all of this is, is just incredibly, incredibly terrible and bad for the country. All it's going to lead to is more siloing and more polarization, but that's what the disintegrationists want. They want everything disintegrated. That is the goal. Okay, now, quick update on COVID. So you're reading all of these sort of panicked headlines about how COVID is going to kill all of us. And I'm failing to see the evidence that COVID is going to kill all of us from the death statistics. So the spike in the United States started approximately two weeks ago. I'm, I'm looking at the case spike in the United States right now. The, the United States coronavirus case spike began. I'm looking at the, at the chart. The, the diagnosed new cases, the spike started around June 6th, June 7th. Right? If you look at the chart, that's when it started to uptick. So we're now at the end of June. right? You would expect that there would be a massive uptick in death because that's what happened at the beginning. The deaths were highly correlative with the positive test cases. Instead, what you have seen is, a, so let's put it this way. There were a, there were a grand total on June 6th of about 22,000 diagnosed cases in the United States. 22, 000, 9, and, and June 8th, let's use June 8th because that was kind of a low point in terms of diagnosed cases, about 18,921 diagnosed cases. This is according to Worldometers. They get their info from Johns Hopkins. 18,000, close to 20,000 diagnosed cases. 
Yesterday, there were 46,000 diagnosed cases in the United States. And so that means that two and a half times as many diagnosed cases as about three weeks ago, or close to a month ago at this point, wouldn't you expect there to be like hmm, three times as many deaths, two times as many deaths, one time as many deaths, 50% as many deaths? Well, instead, what's happened is that the deaths in the United States have declined radically. So in the same period, if you look at the number of deaths on a daily basis, on June 4th, there were over 1,000 deaths in the United States from COVID. Yesterday, there were 764 deaths from COVID in the United States. There has not been a massive death spike. The reason there has not been a massive death spike is because, as it turns out, older people are being smart and staying home, and younger people are getting infected. And when younger people get infected, they don't die. Right? They're not hospitalized for as long. So even the hospitalization statistics are not quite apples to apples. When an older person was hospitalized with COVID, they would get hospitalized, then they would go to the ICU, and then in many cases, they would die. When a younger person is hospitalized, they go to the hospital, and many times they leave the hospital. So the number of people who are leaving the hospital now is much higher. So Mike Pence points this out, and of course, this means he's a bad guy. But the reality is they keep saying things like the hospitals are being overwhelmed. We're, 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 we're all in trouble here. They, they just ignore the fact that hospital CEOs are saying no. So here is Houston Hospital CEO Mark Bloom with, with Houston Methodist. And he's one of several. They, they did their own little press conference, all the heads of the hospitals in Houston. They did their own little presser, and they talked about the status of ICU beds. Listen to them talk about ICU beds. They sound like they're panicked because according to the media, we are on the verge of overrunning the ICU beds in places like Houston, right? Houston is, is literally like ground zero for the places where they are worried about ICU beds being overrun if you read the media. Here are the actual CEOs of the hospital talking about whether they're going to be overrun. Right, Houston Methodist, we're somewhere in the low 90s right now in terms of uh, capacity of ICU beds. But let me put that in perspective. Okay, what was our ICU capacity at one year ago today? It was at 95%. We are highly experienced at utilizing our ICU beds for the sickest of the sick patients day in, day out, as I've said. And it is completely normal for us to have ICU capacities that run in the 80s and 90s. That's how all of us operate hospitals, how all hospitals operate. This is not the only hospital CEO saying this. Dr. Doug, Doug Lawson with St. Luke's Health, another big hospital in Houston, he says, we're all concerned about the spread of the virus. The spread is increasing and incredibly concerning. However, our hospitals are okay and ready to manage the surge appropriately and effectively. Mark Wallace with Texas Children's Hospital, he says the same thing. He says that they are only at 74% occupancy. He says, all of us on this call today, we approach this from a very mission-oriented basis. We're going to be here to fulfill our missions, take care of the patients and families that need to be taken care of. We're going to take care good care of our employees and our medical staff. He says, we have plenty of capacity to take care of the children that get to the doorstep of Children's Texas Hospital. Okay, so, so all of these hospital CEOs are saying the same thing, which is like, we're concerned about the rising COVID cases, but we're not panicked. And the media is running around with their hair on fire. We're all going to die. Look at the spike in cases. The cases are awful. Look at this terrible cases. We're all going to die. So Anthony Fauci testified before the Senate yesterday, and he said that we're going to be at 100,000 new cases a day. Okay, well, I, I have a question. Does that mean that 100, like how many people are those are going to die? He's asked this by Elizabeth Warren. He says, there's going to be a lot of serious death. Thank you for that lack of spe specific information. Thank you. Because guess what? There's, the, there's the, a lot of serious death right now. We're still seeing hundreds of people a day die from this thing. But here's Anthony Fauci talking about the caseload. The caseload is not the real issue. The question is, who is getting it? The question is, how serious are the cases that you are seeing in the hospital? The question is, are the number of deaths in ICUs going down? Are the number of deaths in hospitals going down? Because if not, it, I mean, if, if those things have gone down, then really what we have done effectively is use the exact strategy I advocated a couple of months ago, the controlled avalanche strategy, keep the people who are older and more vulnerable safe. And then if young people get it, then young people get it. And that's just how we reach herd immunity. Here is Dr. Fauci, though, lamenting the rising cases. When you have an outbreak in one part of the country, even though in other parts of the country they're doing well, they are vulnerable. I made that point very clearly last week at a press conference. We can't just focus on those areas that are having the surge. It puts the entire country at risk. We are now having 40 plus thousand new cases a day. I would not be surprised if we go up to 100,000 a day if this does not turn around. And so I am very concerned. OK, like, again, concern is is warranted. Concern is relevant. We should keep wearing masks when you're out in public, because, again, even if young people get sick, it ain't the greatest thing. But the idea that we're about to be overwhelmed in the healthcare systems, I'm not seeing the data that suggests that we're about to be overwhelmed, that we're in a New York level overwhelming of the healthcare system, nor am I seeing the vast uptick in deaths that we were promised. The spike began again in early June. It is now July. 
Okay, today's the first day of July. So all of that could change, right? I'm only going to go based on the evidence. If that starts to change, if we start to see massive upticks in death, then all of the panic that we're seeing from the media and from our governors, maybe that starts to look justified. But if the idea is a bunch of 20-year-olds are getting it and they get like, they, they, they can't taste something for three days and then they're okay, that is just one more person who now cannot pass the disease on to somebody who is older once they are done with the disease. Alrighty, so we'll be back here later today with two additional hours of content. We have plenty more for you where this came from. Plus, we'll be back here tomorrow with the conclusion to our broadcast week because Friday, I believe, we have off for the wonderful July 4th that we should all celebrate. Otherwise, we'll see you here tomorrow. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Colton Haas. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Playback and media operated by Nick Sheehan. Associate producer, Katie Swinnerton. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Nika Geneva. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. Hey, everybody, it's Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know, some people are depressed because the American Republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon has turned to blood. But on The Andrew Claven Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Claven Show and laugh your way through the apocalypse with me, Andrew Claven. <laughs> 